everyone. It is uh, nine o'clock uh, Mountain Time and 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And we want to say good morning to everyone. Welcome to the 15th Annual Symposium of one of the best organizations in athletics, Minority Opportunities Athletics Association, better known as MOA. And I am Dr. China Jude. I currently serve as the president of MOA. I am so excited to kick off our day um, where we're going to be talking about some really crucial uh, issues in the world of athletics. And we have two rock stars who's uh, starting us off today. I want to welcome uh, to the symposium Lynn Elmore and Tom McMillan. Uh, Lynn Elmore is the co-chair of the Knight Commission. He was an All-American basketball player for the University of Maryland and was drafted in the first round uh, by the NBA, specifically the Washington Bullets, now known as the Wizards, and played 10 years in the league. So he has his Juris Doctor from Harvard and is a sports commentator, and the list goes on and on in regards to all of his accomplishments. So uh, read the book, <laughs> read the book. As a matter of fact, he was an author also. So welcome, welcome, Lynn. Um, also, Tom McMillan. Tom McMillan is the president and the CEO of Lead One. He was an All-American basketball player at the University of Maryland. You guys were teammates? Absolutely. You guys were teammates, so you're perfect. You're perfect, and hopefully we can talk about some of those days, too. But uh, Tom was drafted in the NBA also. He's the first Rhodes Scholar from the University of Maryland and began his political career in 1987 after 11 years in the NBA. So Tom has done just a bang-up job on so many things in the world of collegiate sports and have been an advocate for, for women and ethnic minorities and really has served as a champion in so many areas in the world of sports. So welcome, Tom. Trying to thank you. You read that Tom. exactly as I you read that exactly as I wrote it for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm, I'm I'm on my job. So so I just want to let all the attendees know that feel free to utilize our chat. We're going to have a question and answer period send those questions throughout the session so we can make sure that we're addressing um, many of the topics that we're talking about. But let's let's go ahead and, and get started because I know there's so much to cover. And so we talked earlier in our prep session, Tom and Lynn, in regards to what is happening in the world, not only pre but during COVID and then what is happening now and what is considered probably now in a post-COVID world, although COVID is still happening. Uh, so uh, I know I initially asked you, what were the three top things on your mind that you felt that we were going through during COVID and what is going to be carrying over as we are going back to this new normal as we describe it? So Tom, you wanna go ahead and kick us off what do you feel that are the, the three top things that we really need to be mindful on? Well, China, it's great to be with you and, and your um, MOA group. And uh, it's always fun to be with my former teammate, Lenny Elmore. So nice to, nice to be part of this. Um, you know, what I think COVID has done is really forced all schools to, to look at their budgets and to really get it down to essentialities basically and you know all schools have had to deal with no fans literally no tv or limited tv money and it's it's caused a lot of adjustments so that's number one they had to manage through a big financial crisis number two what has happened i think the student athlete was empowered during covid because obviously you had to be very concerned about their health and welfare if you were going to go forward and continue to play. That's what a lot of those kids want to do is play, but yet you had myocarditis. You had a lot of after effects of COVID that everybody had to be cognizant of. And, and third, although there's many things externally that I know Wendy will talk about that are still impacting college sports, and we'll get into it in greater detail, 
one of the things I think going forward is people are beginning to say, well, how can we manage college sports better? Certainly travel is one of them. You know, I don't think you're going to see quite as much travel. We're going to use this uh, mechanism of Zoom more. And I think regional scheduling is going to come more into the fore. I mean, uh, I've had ADs tell me many times that they fly over 10 opponents, oftentimes because they're flying to a far, far-fetched far uh, conference, a, a team way, states, many states away from them. And, and they and they say, why couldn't I just play teams closer to home? So I think that's going to be another development that occurs here. So those are those are a few items. Student athlete empowerment, tremendous financial stresses, and a change in the way that college sports operates. Yeah, and I want to point out that you know, with some regionalization scheduling, uh, Division Two actually does that and have demonstrate uh, some success in that. So I wouldn't be surprised that a lot of uh, the Division One representatives look at that Division Two and Division Three model. Uh, what What are your thoughts about that, Lynn? What are you What do you see are the three issues that happened during COVID that is currently now carrying over? Well, first of all, let me echo what Tom said. It's great to be with you guys and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And, and I agree with Tom 100% um, uh, where he has taken a, a more practical view simply because, again, he is uh, more deeply involved with athletic programs and, and Division One athletic directors and their concerns, et cetera. You know, where I sit, uh, particularly from the Knight Commission, you know, we take more of a, you know, a 10,000 foot view. And, and the three things I think that, uh, that not necessarily have been uh, uh, spawned by COVID, but certainly are going to affect, be affected by COVID, but also affect overall uh, the college sports and the governance of college sports, you know, would be some of the court cases. Alston, for instance, you know, COVID had an enormous adverse impact on budgets, as everyone knows, in 2020 and 2021. And now the issue is allowing educational benefits beyond current limits, you know, it could place even more pressure on, on program finances. And for those who want to engage in the arms race for recruitment and for retention, basically due to the transfer rules. So, you know, what the Supreme Court comes up with uh, at the end of June with regard to Austin, it will have tremendous impact. And, and, and again, COVID has kind of uh, magnified that. Then we look at NIL, uh, you know, name, image, and likeness, and it's the same thing that awaits uh, programs. You know, enforcement will be uh, critical. And, you know, without uniformity and, and under these various state laws, again, the, the impact on budgets particularly and the impact on um, institutional integrity with regard to recruiting uh, certainly will be, be under the microscope. And finally, as Tom said, the, the awakening giant of athlete activism, you know, this moment of racial reconciliation and, and reckoning, uh, this moment uh, may become a movement. You know, I'm probably one of the few, and I guess I can include Tom because we're the same age. Uh, but 1968 with Harry Edwards and when he galvanized athletes, I mean, today's athlete is more liberated, more attuned to the great inequities of our time. And they also recognize their power. Uh, you know, COVID highlighted the value of, of revenue athletes to programs and, and the sports that they play. And, and now these athletes have a better understanding of their impact. And I can only uh, use uh, one of the greatest examples was the University of Missouri several years ago when their football team proposed a boycott. They wound up getting rid of several campus leaders who weren't responsive to the racism on campus. And, you know, that proposed boycott uh, threatened a million dollars a game. Uh, and, and the athletes were recognizing that. And so, you know, today's athletes understand exactly the power that they have. And that's something that people are going to have to deal with. Well, let's go ahead and start with the latter part of that uh, student athlete activism, because I know that there are student athletes who may feel a sense of uncomfortability to really utilize their, um, their name or their position to try to make a significant difference when it comes to these uh, social justice issues because they're trying to prepare for the league. Do you think that now that that is being pretty much taken away or they shouldn't have to be concerned about that 
that uh, from your perspective, you would think that those who are pursuing the league, that could be that added bonus of adding that um, uh, significant profile for the athlete being more involved and engaged. And that gives that athlete a bigger voice now. You want me to well, I mean, I, I personally think that, well, I was gonna, I was just gonna say that I think that athletes today uh, recognize that even the pro leagues, the NFL uh, to a great extent uh, and, and NBA to an even greater extent have countenanced and, and have allowed uh, that type of, um, the, the type of demonstration of, of uh, concern. And, and they've allowed some advocacy in, in those areas. So I'm not sure that it would, um, you know, stifle the, the outspokenness of these athletes. I think it's in the NCAA standpoint, uh, I think might be an issue, an institutional standpoint where it might be an issue. And if people read our, um, our, the pro, our report um, from the Knight Commission, Achieving Racial Equity in College Sports, one of the tenets that, that we recommend is that you know, athletes, particularly black athletes, get a better opportunity to be advocates on campus, um, not only from a leadership standpoint, but also, you know, to have input on, on certain things that, uh, you know, will directly affect them and that directly affect the campus and social justice. So, you know, I think it's almost a training ground as it should be. Um, I, I, would, I would echo, I would agree with Lenny on that. You know, we both were in school in the 70s and Outside of our dorm windows, there were yeah. riots about Vietnam and protests and demonstrations and tear gas and everything. And, you know, what's interesting, there was a lot of student activism, but there wasn't a lot of student athlete activism back then. It's just, you know, you went about your business, you were worrying about school and playing uh, sports. And Plus, we were threatened. We were threatened if we got involved, we'd lose our scholarship. Well, that's right. I mean, it was a, it was a different environment. Now I look and, and see young people and they're so much more free and they have platforms. Their social media platforms give them uh, tremendous opportunities. The challenge here is to take activism and to make the enterprise more productive, it is safer and better for these student athletes. But and, and we'll talk about this as we get into this, not turn college sports into a mirror image of, you know, college basketball, college football, turn into a mirror image of the NBA and NFL. And I think that the problem is parsing that line. Where, where do you say student activism is good? And where does it start to cross the line to where we are evolving college sports into commercial enterprises like the NFL and NBA? And that's where I know Lenny feels the same way. That's where, you know, we've got to do more to protect student athlete health, welfare and safety and do all those things. Uh, but there has to be a line draw. And that's so an AD called me up the other day, he says college sports really needs to define itself. Is it a it's not a pro model and it's not truly an amateur model. What is it? And it's this. Nether, nether area, this kind of not defined position that it's in is causing lots of problems. And that, that's where I think the trick is with student, student activism. There has to be a line between making it better for them, but not turning it into, you know, a mirror image of the pros. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Tom, because I, you know, the, the next question I was going to ask um, it was, was to talk about the NIL and how student athletes are utilizing their name, image, and likeness to help with some of those social justice issues. But to really ask the question, why are individuals uncomfortable to address uh, the NIL and why is it taking so long? Do you think it really compromised the amateurism status and mission that the NCAA has created? Or is it the fact that we're still just trying to get students to attend class? Now we're teaching them about taxes and contracts and agents and all these other things that could be a bit overwhelming to the students. So when you mention about it's not amateur, it's not pro, it's kind of that hybrid. So why do you think that people are a little uncomfortable with addressing the NIL? Well, 
back in 1990, I wrote a book called Out of Bounds. And I said, we coaches' salaries were just approaching a million dollars. They just crossed the line. I said, if that, if college sports didn't control the arms race back then, you were going to have an arms race for student athletes. They were going to demand more and more and more. And they rightfully should. If there's a coach making 10 million, these athletes are going to ask and demand for more. And so that's one of the challenges that we face. And so NIL, which is, should be a natural right. It's a publicity right. It should be somewhat th something that is sort of innate to each individual has become this contentious issue because everybody feels it's just another step on the road to fully commercializing college sports. When, if it had been handled differently in the very beginning, I think it would have been a right that could be intrinsically given to kids. And I don't think that it would have necessarily distorted the enterprise to any great degree. And so now we're dealing with, okay, all, how do we, how do we jury rig this? So we don't have recruiting abuses. We don't have all the other things going on. And, and I just, I feel that uh, all of our ADs, I would say most, if not most, if not 90 some percent of them are fully in support of name image and likeness for, for uh, student athletes. So don't think that's the issue. I think it's a slippery soap argument. They're afraid what's the locker room gonna look like when someone's driving a Porsche, all those kinds of related issues. How are you going to stop recruiting abuses on this? When they can't stop it today, how are they gonna stop it with NIL? So there are legitimate concerns and I think that's where the, the doubts are. I remember in our, our conversation, earlier conversation, Lynn, you mentioned something about restricting coaches' salaries. Did, can you, if, if that was correct, what you said, can you speak a little bit about your perspective of that? Yeah, um, you know, what I said was that the, when you take a look at the, the salaries that, that coaches are, are, are making, and, and I'm not against anybody doing the best that they possibly can, but, you know, institution leaders will also agree that, you know, the level of coaching salaries that rival those of, of pro sports, you know, in, in the context of higher education and, and an environment where, you know, we need to do more to address the health, safety uh, concerns of college athletes, their education and other areas, and many times those are underfunded, that, that you know, those high coaching salaries are, are, are relatively inappropriate. And, you know, you make a comparison to faculty as well and other staff members. Um, that's where the issue is. And the point that, that I wanted to make is that we keep talking about, um, you know, making it even uh, since the coaches are making so much money, then the student athletes should make so much money. Uh, but the bottom line is that we keep, seem to be attacking it from the wrong side. Instead of, you know, putting more uh, with regard to uh, things that ultimately are going to lead to pay for play, you know, why don't we find ways to end the arms race, to limit the arms race? Again, we're not talking about, um, you know, stifling coaching salaries, period. We're just talking about bringing them more into line with what uh, people who are uh, working in higher institutions uh, of learning are, are getting paid. And so from that standpoint, that's where we talk about, um, you know, uh, antitrust exemption on a limited basis, a conditional basis to give the administrative body like the NCAA an opportunity to take some action that will, you know, place a ceiling you know, not to take away the ability to make a great living, but to place a ceiling on some of these on some of these um, salaries. You know, when you look at the, the 50 states in the United States, we think, what is it, 48 states? When you take a look at the highest paid uh, state employee, it's the football coach, which is which is absolutely amazing. Now, another thing, and Tom mentioned it to 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 a great extent. Um, you know, we're talking about um, from a contextual standpoint. I, you know, one of the things that I have always looked at is the idea that, you know, from a semantic standpoint, uh, the, the narrative has been hijacked. You know, people now to allow the, the conversation to turn to how much more student athletes should be able to make, then instead of talking about value, the value of scholarship, the value of presence on campus, the value of the education, people keep talking about labor. Now, I know Tom and I, I can agree, when we played, we could never call that labor. 
Um, you know, I might have labored in class, unlike Tom, but <laughs> nevertheless, it, it wasn't about labor. And now today's people speak of participating in college sports as labor, and that's really hijacked the narrative and turned it on its head. And we've got to come back to the concept of value, not dollars and cents, but value. And I agree with Lenny. The, uh, the problem is that the, the answer to so many folks and even the public, uh, public opinion is doubling down and let's Let's pay athletes, give them collective bargaining. Let's, let's go down that path when really the higher ed community wants to take a step back and they want to curtail the arms race. We did a survey of our ADs. 96% of them said that they would love Congress to give them some mechanism to control spending, to Lenny's point. That's exactly right. They want to do it. But this is like the Soviet Union and the United States. They could never, no one could unilaterally disarm back then. Uh, so they kept building missiles and missiles until we got arms control agreements. Well, we need arms control agreements for college sports. And until they, unless they do that, we are going to in 10 years, college basketball and college football are going to look like the NBA and NFL. And I think that'll have very negative consequences for higher ed in college sports. And I think I think that's sort of the bottom line here. And uh, our ADs want that kind of world. They want to take the step back uh, to, to Lenny's point. Presidents want to do that. But the narrative right now, there's a hearing Wednesday in the Commerce Committee. It's going to be all about student athlete empowerment. And they're not going to be talking about the enterprise. And I, I strongly urge Mark Emmert to talk about the enterprise, the need to take a step back, because if they don't do that, we're heading in a we're heading in a world of greater and greater commercialism. Wait a minute. So the way that I interpret this, Tom, you're telling me that athletic directors want this to happen, but they rather for Congress to make those decisions on their behalf. And let's well, the problem the problem is that you have collusion issues and so forth. But the truth of the matter is that if the, the conferences and the CFP and the NCAA got together, they give out $4 billion a year. And they said, look, we're going to uniformly create incentives in the system so that you, to, to, to kind of slow down the arms race, we're going to spread the money around based on that value. The NCAA already does that on academic values. They give money based on academic values. They could easily do it to slow the arms race down. You, Frankly, you don't need Congress. Uh, Judge Wilkins has said college sports has enough control and wherewithal through the power of the purse to put in place voluntary incentives. Doesn't mean you have to do it. Just like the NBA, the luxury tax. You know, an owner can blow right through the luxury tax, say, yes, I'm going to pay Kevin Durant, all those guys up there, a lot of money, and I'll pay the luxury tax. But what it does do, it clamps down on the spending through incentives. College sports has that power today. and But Congress would only make it stronger if they could get something like that. But here's yeah. the problem. Here's the problem, though, that, you know, the, this disparate interest. And when you talk about incentives to get paid more money, there are power five schools that are making money hand over fist, essentially, you know, without, let's say, pre-COVID days. They're making so much money, they don't need the incentives. They're, going, they're incentivized by continuing business as usual, as opposed to, say, the group of five and, and other, you know, FCF, F, FCS schools who, from the football standpoint, you know, need to have these incentives, need to slow down. Uh, the arms race, even though they realize that, that participating in it ultimately means their demise. Uh, but nevertheless, they want to continue to compete because that's the only way they believe that they can survive. So the disparate interests, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, the, the Knight Commission has uh, proposed a, a transformation of, of college sports and take the FBS schools, uh, particularly Power Five schools, separate them so they have the, a group that have the same interests and they compete as, and allow others to uh, essentially, you know, compete with, uh, within their realm of interest. Um, you know, if you do that, there's been a, um, a, 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 a report that essentially 
reveals that over $60 million can be saved in doing that. And you can apply that to other sports, create greater opportunities in other sports for the schools that aren't in that separate um, you know, college football sphere. And, and let's recognize that um, the NCAA distributes money and it should, distribute much, should distribute money only to, to, to schools that are involved in the championships that uh, essentially that they control. And so they don't control championships in <clears throat> football. That's the college football playoff. And college football playoff money is, is given, is distributed to schools uh, with, with no restrictions whatsoever. You know, that's, those, that's the dollars that essentially amount, uh, in my opinion, that amount to the ex excess that, that we're talking about right now, where there are no restrictions, you know, the buyout monies, the high salaries, et cetera. You know, that's what gives the advantage. Now, people say, well, you know, traditionally we can't change that, but the NCAA did change. And they changed along the lines of, of, of aligning schools with interests, same interests. They did that in 1971 when we split into three divisions. And, and so right now, what we have now is outmoded. I, I think Tom speaks uh, to the idea of a, a new plan of distribution that will, you know, help us slow down the arms race, but something certainly needs to be done. And we certainly need to align institutions along the same lines of interest. You know, Lynn, I've, I've listened to that presentation that, that uh, you and the Knight Commission uh, representatives spoke about in terms of uh, segregating. And I, I must admit, just off of a lot of the private conversations that I had that <laughs> made a lot of people feel uncomfortable because although you addressed uh, Title IX, what would what, what it look like for Title IX? Does that now uh, position even G5s to say, well, maybe we should split too? Or it, it just made a lot of individuals feel uncomfortable. And I know the, for, the Knight Commission is very forward thinking but do you really truly believe that that's something that is considered to be realistic without impacting the other, the non-football institutions, the FCSs? What are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, as I said, they, the report uh, and the findings in the report said that at least $60 million or more will be freed. And so therefore that money can be spent on you know, other athletic opportunities for not only women in Title IX, but you know, continue to create, not shrink uh, the number of teams and, and the number of sports. Uh, you know, that money can be utilized to create more opportunity. Remember, you know, what is it, 185,000 approximately students are playing sports in college, only 7%, only 7%, uh, at least the number that I found, play uh, you know, Division One FBS football. So that other 93% need to be considered as well. And a program like what we have, uh, we have proposed will create greater opportunity in, in that fashion. And China, you said that, you know, some people felt uncomfortable, but we've had tremendous positive uh, response from conferences that aren't necessarily FBS conferences. You know, we have presented to a number of, of, of the smaller conferences, of, of the FCS conferences and non-Power 5 conferences who listen to us with great interest. So, you know, is, is it absolute? And can it be tinkered with a little bit? Absolutely. But the concept is one that I think that, uh, you know, has had some traction and we'll see how far it goes. Awesome. Tom, let's, let's uh, uh, switch gears a little bit. Um, Lynn mentioned uh, the, the research and, and the papers they've written on the Knight Commission. Let's talk a little bit about Lead One's um, mm -hmm. white paper in regards to uh, the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. I'm, I'm very honored and fortunate to serve as a co-chair for that white paper and addressing senior leadership positions. And so what made you make that decision to move forward to assemble all of this, this wonder, these wonderful committee members uh, to help create this white paper? Well, in, in fairness, you know, I do think it's part of the whole uh, evolution of college sports is to be, you know, progressive on these issues of student athlete empowerment, taking care of their health, welfare, and safety. You know, I was on the commission at the University of Maryland, we went through the Jordan McNair thing, which was so tragic. And so, you know, I do think college sports should be exemplary of these kinds of trends and, and, 
And certainly diversity is one of them. You know, what's interesting for me as I research this and as we've gone through this, uh, China and the Knight Commission as well, you know, when I was in Congress, uh, Bill Bradley, myself and Ed Towns, we said, you know, why don't colleges disclose graduation rates of their students and their student athletes? And everybody said, that's, that's ridiculous. The NCAA fought it. They said, why should we have to disclose our graduation rates? And so we got a bill passed, NCAA opposed it, to disclose graduation rates of students and student athletes. And what a difference. Can you imagine college sports today without graduation rates? Well, I, I wonder why they don't do similar things in diversity. You know, the NCAA submits, a re, they, they ask for a report every year, the uh, sports sponsorship and participation rates report. You submit it every year and you tell about the number of athletes, athletic staff and student athletes in each category of gender and ethnicity and done by sports. And I said to myself, well, that's not public. Schools can access it, but it's not public information. I said, well, why, why don't they make that public? That would do more to drive diversity than anything else that we can possibly do because disclosure is the great disinfectant. And so the reason why we got involved in this because there are so many of our ADs that are really passionate about that. You saw it on that work group, China, how many of those folks really felt strongly about it. You had gone through your journey. You know how difficult it is. And, and, and there should be things that can be done systemically and institutionally to make that dirt journey less painful than it has been for you or less challenging. And so, you know, we're very much committed to it because it's, it's something college sports should do. And they should be exemplary and they should be a role model. And so that's the simple answer. Do you think that there should be some type of incentive or and or punishment, consequence? And, and Lynn, this is also for you too, and in regards to uh, diversity in senior leadership positions. Um, I see that the West Coast Conference created this Russell rule here in the NFL. We have the Rooney rule that we're working through. So what, what are your thoughts in regards to that? Well, I mean, first of all, our uh, Achieving Racial Equity uh, Report, uh, again, on our website, nightcommission.org, certainly endorses uh, lead one's position. Um, you know, we, we expressly stated that, and we endorse the Russell Rule as well. And, and those things obviously can continue uh, to morph and, and, and improve based on context. But, you know, in the end, I, I think one of the things would be an incentive for uh, institutions, uh, particularly for athletic programs, uh, to hire in, in, a, in a more diverse fashion. Uh, you know, coaches have incentives to, to win games and to graduate athletes, so why not have this? And, and, and when you talk about uh, disincentives or when you talk about penalties, I think the penalties will speak for themselves. As Tom mentioned, uh, to publicly um, announce a, a position of an institution and, and where they are on diversity, et cetera, will have adverse impact or should have adverse impact on recruiting, on, on their recognition um, and, and on their standing. Uh, if it's publicly seen that they're dragging their feet or you know, they have no, uh, no direct interest in hiring uh, diverse candidates. Uh, you know, I think today, as I mentioned, today's athletes and their families are, pardon the, the, the colloquialism, they are woke. And they recognize that, you know, why go to a school that, you know, doesn't want to hire people that look like me? Um, you know, so I, I think that losing out on, on, uh, on athletes and, and having uh, essentially, you know, being kind of vilified in, in the public forum certainly uh, would have uh, some, uh, some disincentive for people not to look at hiring uh, on a diverse basis. But uh, again, it, it really comes down to uh, a, allowing uh, moral suasion, uh, allowing public uh, opinion uh, to be uh, essentially a, a provider of impetus to, to get schools to recognize that as you know, institutions of higher learning, as Tom said, you have to be exemplary. Uh, you know, uh, the point of this is that when we look at when we looked at 
corporate America. I serve on a board. It's the largest television station and owner in the in the world. And every senior manager has part of their bonus plan on how diverse their hires are. Well, I mean, that those kinds of carrots work, and that's sort of along the line that we made our recommendation as well. So I do think carrots are important. I also think I really believe disclosure is is at the top of the list because to Lenny says young athletes who are now becoming smarter and wiser and, and, and understand these issues, when they look at a school, they're not going to be looking at the one or two coaches that come to show them around when they recruit. They're going to be looking at the whole university, the whole culture, and they're going to make their decision as to, you know, what that means to them. Lenny could talk about his experience at Maryland, you know, uh, Maryland was just turning the tide, uh, but yet it was not by any means racially integrated by the time. But even when you were in school there, Lenny, I mean, your perspective is very valuable there. Well, I mean, one of the things that, that moved me to, to go to the University of Maryland was in the ACC, which is televised in New York. Uh, you know, I thought the basketball obviously was highly competitive, but when you look at the conference, um, they were the first to integrate uh, in any major sport in football. And Maryland was also the first to integrate in basketball. And they were the first to have an assistant coach of color, which was George Rabbit. So all of those things certainly had impact on me and it had impact on my family. And we're talking over 50 some odd years ago. And these kids today are much smarter than I am. So, you know, they, they recognize uh, certainly the, the impact there. But but absolutely, it, it really comes down to, you know, placing pressure on folks in, in the public uh, in, in the public forum uh, to to affect change. And we also have to remember it's not just the diversity side; it's the inclusion, right, as well as belonging. So uh, you know, it's one of the things that I I said to my athletic director when I started working at University of Wyoming is you got me here, how are you going to keep me here? And how am I going to be included in some of the decisions uh, as we're growing in this department, especially during the COVID time? So we have to keep that in mind. It's beyond just checking the box. Lynn, I, I, did I see you on a webinar in regards to HBCUs? Uh, and yes, you did. Yes. So can you speak a little bit about, uh, you did some research on, on uh, how to provide more support to HBCUs. Uh, I know that I'm an HBCU graduate, proud graduate of Alabama State University. And so it just warms my heart to continue to see progress being made in HBCUs, specifically, uh, not only in the academic side, but when it comes to um, considering um, HBCU coaches, transitioning over to PWIs, the financial resources, the, the credibility of HBCUs and what HBCUs bring to the table in higher education. Can, so can you speak a little bit about your role in, um, uh, in HBCUs and, and getting them to be a little bit more uh, respected <laughs> and when it comes to college sports? Well, again, it, it, this all uh, is, is generated out of our research in our report, Achieving Racial Equity in College Sports. And, you know, by comparison to PWIs, predominantly white institutions, you know, we found that there are a lot of experiences on HBCU campuses that could be replicated on, on campuses of, of PWIs for that concept of inclusion, for the idea of, of the belonging uh, that uh, many of the PWIs don't practice, um, you know, certainly mentorships and, and the ability to, to, to reach out, uh, having uh, faculty athletic representatives and, and other uh, officials uh, in leadership that look like uh, these student athletes. But, but equally as important though, we also recognize that, you know, HBCUs have a different mission, um, you know, notwithstanding the excellence that they've demonstrated over the years, over the decades uh, in, in educating, uh, students and particularly college athletes, but we also recognize that today there's a different mission. Uh, over 70% of 
at least based on our research, 70% of students attending HBCUs are from uh, lower income families and, and you know, a, a large, uh, significant number are first generation. And, and so therefore, you know, there are, are certain needs that um, HBCUs have that other institutions don't necessarily have. And so one of the ways that it's been manifest is when you look at the APR and the penalties doled out by the APR have a <clears throat> disproportionate effect on HBCUs. In, a, in effect, you know, over 70% of those penalized uh, for not reaching the, the, the magic number of, uh, what is it, 930 in, in, a, in the APR, over 70% of them are HBCUs, uh, but you know, they only make up 7% of Division I. And the biggest reason is the lack of resources. Now, you know, the NCA has a fund that they give to low resource universities, not just HBCUs, but others. But, you know, it's only essentially $20 million. And when you distribute that over the number of uh, low resource uh, institutions, that's not a significant amount of money to be able to provide academic support, to provide some of the other uh, programs necessary to, um, you know, to, to bring students, to give them an opportunity to achieve. And, and we've recognized that uh, by comparison to institutions that do have the resources, to be able to provide the various programs that are going to help their college athletes, you know, achieve and, and stay on on um, on progress to, to graduate. And so, you know, we've uh, been advocates for an increase in those areas. And this is just not something that we've made up. You know, we interviewed a number of officials in HBCU conferences on HBCU campuses, and have recognized that these are the needs. And, and that's all it takes. You know, these athletes, these college athletes, are as capable as anyone else both on the field and, and in the classroom. This just requires the same types of programs that PWIs have. So that's essentially what we've been able uh, to glean from our research and we've been advocating in our uh, report achieving racial equity in college sports. Well, as a proud graduate of an HBCU, I really appreciate that research and we need to continue to, to support them. And I do agree additional resources need to be needed to be provided. You know, Tom, there, I know Deion Sanders are <laughs> one of uh, the, the, the most uh, visible HBCU football coach out there spoke about not having uh, any HBCU representation during the draft. Uh, I see that there is a combine that's being created specifically for HBCU um, players. What are your thoughts in regards to that? I mean, does that uh, does that shine a great spotlight on the tradition of HBCU players, or do you think that that's just another segregation that we have cr created and not um, combining those HBCU players with those who are participating in the NFL combine? Do you think a, a separate combine is helpful? Well. Let me just say this. My experience with HBCUs goes back to my days at the University of Maryland board where we had three HBCUs. We had Coppin, we had Bowie State, and we had, uh, we had Eastern Shore. And it was very clear to me that these campuses were always under-resourced. They, you know, and so I'm so glad to see Mackenzie Bezos put, you know, her billion dollar plus gifts into these schools because it will make a difference and it will help them. As far as a separate combine, you know, I'm, I, I can't say that I'm the expert on that. You know, I, you know, the, the, they have one for the G league, they have these little separate organizations for the G league. So a lot of times that may be opportunistic. The best thing that could happen overall is that these schools are a greater resource. Maryland, we just allocated a whole lot of new money to the HBCUs with Bezos gifts, some of these uh, schools now are allocating those dollars to their athletic department. They're going to be much more competitive going forward. And so I could see other gifts like this that would transform it. So I, I'd, I'd rather find a way to mainstream these programs than to create separate programs. That would be my general framework. And China, if I can add, I mean, Tom kind of alluded to it. Remember, we, the proof is in the pudding. And the state of Maryland just reached a settlement with their HBCU, over almost $600 million uh, that they've under-resourced uh, those, uh, those institutions. And I'm sure that's the truth in, in a whole lot of other states and 
lawyers are working on that as well. So it just tells you that, you know, despite not having the same resources or resources they're entitled to, they've still been able to turn out, you know, quality students and quality student athletes. But, you know, given the opportunity and given the, the resources that they're entitled to, they can do more. Definitely agree. Don't, with that. don't oh. forget Howard University right now with our vice president being an illustrious graduate. I mean, Howard is really on on fire, and they're a very, very uh, you know attractive institution. And I'm sure their sports programs were going to reflect that as they go forward. Yeah, a lot of HBCUs are definitely growing. Uh, there's a little bit of movement in the the swag where a lot of PWIs are, forgive the term, poaching on some HBCUs to move over. So it's going to be pretty interesting to see how um, the, the MEAC and the SWAC, SWAC is going to, to grow. Um, with that, you know, we have a lot of student athletes transferring <laughs> all over the place. And now that the transfer portal is opened up and it's uh, the highest number of transfers uh, this year, I mean, are, are coaches living for the year as opposed to building a foundation uh, to build a championship caliber program for four years? What are your, your thoughts in regards to that? Well, I would first of all say that, you know, with 1,600 kids in the portal, I think that college sports is going to look more and more like the pros with transient rosters year to year without the kind of uh, permanence that college sports has had. I'm sure Lenny and I, I mean, I could have named all the Yankees when I was a kid. It's pretty, it gets pretty hard to do that today with the changeover in the rosters. The second thing is a lot of kids are going to get left behind going into the transfer portal. One of the things that we're looking at is how many kids don't find a home after they go into the portal. And that could be one of the tragedies of this. And the last point I'd make, is that this is going to impact smaller schools, mid-majors, a great deal. Because a lot of times, the Power 5 schools will just go into a, a mid-major and poach a, ki a, a kid out of the mid-majors as opposed to taking a chance on a kid out of high school. So this may mean less opportunities coming out of high school. And you may see this uh, kind of migration where a high school kid has to go to a mid-major to prove themselves before they can go to a big school. So it will have profound impacts on college sports. And this is where, when I originally opened up and talked about Austin and NIL, this is where they could have uh, some extraordinary impact. Uh, and some people may look at it as adverse impact. You know, without the proper uh, guardrails, um, if Austin does allow the educational benefits beyond current limits, some schools are able to provide, others can't. Those will be incentives to try to uh, recruit uh, particular athletes. You know, my, my, our benefits are better than theirs. And therefore, you know, you come to us. Same thing with NIL. Um, you know, with the states, the various states having uh, different laws, some of them even more favorable to the student athlete and less favorable to the institutions. You know, without having the guardrails and uniformity, you know, there are some states that have institutions that can draw the best student athletes to them because they give them a greater opportunity to quote make money if you will so you know this thing could, could turn into the wild wild west if um if there aren't there isn't uniformity in nil and if uh the supreme court decides that the, you know alston and, and their argument is correct and, and that's where you know we're really going to have some issues without some type of um, some type of congressional uh you know inter, in, involvement yeah, you know, one, of the, one of the things is rosters. Rosters are going to be, you know, they're they're going to change so frequently that, and a coach will never be able to not stop recruiting, and it will also make them have to play more players. Otherwise, they'll just walk out the door, <laughs> and uh, walking out the door is not always a greener pasture. And I think this is going to have profound, profound consequences. I never quite understood how. When a school spends a lot of money recruiting a kid, and they do sometimes, they, they take private planes, they do all this, and they sign them up, and the kid says, I want to leave, and they can go without compunction. It, it, it's a, uh, and part of that is, again, being driven by coaches. Even though there are buyouts with coaches' contracts, coach walks out the door, 
He has a vial. In this case, an athlete can walk out the door and there's no consequences. And so it's not exactly, it's not exactly parody right now. Uh, and I think, as Lenny says, unintended consequences will really be uh, interesting to, to watch with this development. So, Yeah, I mean, with APR, I mean, it will impact APR. We got to make sure that they hit those scores before they transfer. And then how, going back to what you said, Lynn, about coaches' contracts, because if they're living for the year, <laughs> as opposed to now – do you, you look at all of those coaches' contracts that are for five and six and seven years long, knowing that these, these athletes are going to continue to just go in, go out, it's like a revolving door. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's actually going to have maybe have impact on how coaches' uh, contracts are negotiated. Uh, you know, institutions may say, okay, based upon these transfer rules, maybe – you know, we have to hold coaches' feet to the fire with regard to maintaining uh, the, the student athlete and not, you know, giving them reason to transfer. And equally as important, you know, coaches may say, okay, don't judge us on wins and losses anymore. Let's try something else. You know, I, they may actually even say judge us on graduation, et cetera. Wouldn't that be something? Yeah, we'll take that. We definitely <laughs> will. We're going to go ahead and uh, get some questions. Dan, we got Lauren. Uh, who's going to read some questions for you guys. Uh, Lauren, you want to go ahead and chime in on the first question? Absolutely. As we just talked about coaches, this is a, a really timely question. Uh, there are a lot of retirements um, and exits at both the high profile coach level and the AD chair. We're interested in learning, what do you attribute some of this exodus to? Uh, I'll jump in and say the first thing I think is that uh, recognition that times are changing. Um, attitudes, values, et cetera, are changing. And some of the coaches, uh, when you look at them, many of them are, are close to what in uh, the general uh, employment field would be retirement age. Uh, but in coaching, obviously, people can surpass that. But many of these coaches are, are understanding that maybe they're not nearly as in touch with these young people, not nearly as in touch with the rules that have been established that have changed so often, but now have reached a point where, you know, it's almost uh, an opposite uh, effect on, on their ability as well as their understanding of, of, of what it is to coach and to recruit. So, you know, I, I think the changing times have a profound impact on, you know, whether coaches decide to stay or not stay. And, and you know, you'll use Duke, I'll use Duke as, as a prime example. This, you know, one more year, maybe the Mike Krzyzewski can, can win. He doesn't want his legacy to be a team. Uh, his last team didn't make the NCAA tournament. But I really believe that the changes in attitudes, the changes in how uh, young people view the game and the changes in the rules of how coaches can, can recruit and, and, and operate uh, have forced a lot of the, the older coaches to say it's time. And I would echo that. I, I would say the pressure on ADs, <clears throat> so great today. And, uh, you know, it's just the, there's a lot of uncertainty in the college sports horizon. And I think that's driving some people to, to reevaluate. We had several ADs that moved over to development. They said, look, you know, I, I want to get out of this rat race of being an AD and I want to go into development. So I, I, I think it's part of the, um, the, cha the rapidly changing landscape. Great. Lauren, any, any other questions? Uh, yes, we have one more, um, which is how do you anticipate um, some of these issues, particularly in relation to NIL, impacting non-revenue producing sports um, and or impacting the Division II or Division Three landscape? The fear among some of our ADs was that, uh, you know, a NIL, and again, we don't know what the regulatory environment is. We don't know what the, uh, even what the, the, any of the laws are going to look like, particularly at the federal level. But, you know, um, let's just hypothesize that certain basketball and football players generate uh, certain uh, levels of NIL 
will that hurt other sports? I'm not sure it will. I actually think some of the opportunities for non-revenue athletes could be very great. I mean, if you are an athlete and have 2 million followers on TikTok or whatever, you can monetize that and, and make, make do very well. So I don't think it'll affect other sports as much. It may, in fact, help those other non-revenue athletes who are good at building a brand. So I, I think there's some positive here, not negatives. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree that uh, essentially it's all about being social influencers, I think. That's where the money is. And yes, revenue generating sports because of visibility, some of those uh, highly visible athletes in basketball and to a certain extent football will make some money. But, you know, you recently saw an agreement where, you know, athletes will be able, and particularly non-revenue athletes, will be able to make money on, on uh, putting things on Twitter and, and getting uh, followers there. Uh, also, as Tom mentioned, TikTok. That's all about social influence, uh, influencers as opposed to, you know, absolute stardom in a particular sport. So there are various ways that, uh, and on a local basis, various ways that non-revenue sports athletes can find ways to make money. But again, it may not be of the magnitude of, of the uh, revenue generating stars, but they're going to be few and far between anyway. Yeah, the social media influencers, I think, is going to go to a, a whole nother level. You know, I it's interesting now people utilize the, the star football player and the car dealership examples. Well, it's those models, those makeup artists, <laughs> right. those uh, pop culture announcers. Those are the ones that are really moving forward a little bit faster. Um, that's, that's the questions that we have so far, of course, that if anyone has additional questions, feel free to email it to, to Moa and we can always forward it to Tom and Lynn for a response. Uh, Tom, Lynn, do you have any closing remarks uh, before I close out this session? Well, I would say, you know, remember the uh, great poem, I came to a fork and road and went to the less traveled, that's made all the difference. I'm afraid the less traveled road here is cutting back spending and investing in greater opportunities for student athletes. That the idea here is that instead of having 50,000 FBS athletes, we have 150,000 and create athletes for first time college goers and all that. That's the model of college sports, but I think it's the lesser road right now. I think we're going down the road of greater commercialization. And we may, when we get down that road too far, may sit back and say, is this where we want to head? And that'll be the challenge over the next decade. I would say as administrators, particularly if you have the ear of your institutional leaders, just maintain that focus on education, health, safety, and well-being of student athletes as main primary. And regardless of the environment that we have based on Alston, NIL, um, or other things uh, that may affect you know, the rules governing uh, college sports, you know, maintain those particular principles, keep them in mind, influence your uh, your institutional leaders, and I think we can save college sports. Yes, definitely. And we didn't have the opportunity to talk about mental health, but that is extremely important in making sure that our student athletes have the necessary resources to continue to, to live in this COVID world that we're in while addressing academics, athletics, um, social justice issues, diversity and inclusion. I mean, there is just so much that's happening. Um, thank you, Lynn and Tom, for your time today. This was a great conversation. You know, the landscape of collegiate and athletics is going to be interesting and challenging. And we know both of you are going to be a part of shaping the, the future of college sports. So thank you for sharing your insight with us. And to all of our attendees, thank you for spending an hour with us on this important topic. Uh, day one of the symposium continues at 4 p.m. with a session on contract negotiations for coaches and game guarantees. So I hope that you can join us um, during this, the opportunities to have these breakout rooms at 4 p.m. to learn some tricks of the trade from some of the experts in the area. 
Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at MOA Diversity One. That's MOA Diversity and the number one for more exciting symposium information. Tomorrow at 10 a.m., you're going to get a link to my presidential address and the announcements for the 2021 MOA Award winners on Twitter. Uh, thank you again, and have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.